This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome. This is Craig Thomas, your host on Much Modern Medicine, part of Think Tech Hawaii's live stream series, and assisted as always by our engineers, Rich and Ray. And today we have three folks from the Honolulu Fire Department. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, I tell you what, since there are three, why don't you each introduce yourself and uh, give a little blurb about what you do at the fire department. Hey, let's start with you, Charles. Good morning. I'm Charles Griff with the Honolulu Fire Department. I'm a fire captain. I have a little more than 24 years now, and currently I'm assigned to our Training and Research Bureau's medical section, our AD and CPR particularly. Excellent. Thanks. Hi, good morning. Barry Burnett. I'm a firefighter three in the Honolulu Fire Department. Uh, just over 15 years, I'm also with the Training and Research Bureau in the medical section with uh, Cap Charles Grip here, taking care of mainly the AED and CPR program. And Libby. Good morning. I'm doing medical direction with Honolulu Fire Department. I'm Libby Char. Welcome, all of you. And Thank you. Thank you. You know, what we're going to be talking about today is what to do when someone collapses. Uh, often those collapses are due to what uh, can turn into what we call sudden cardiac death. We hope that is the outcome. And it's a chance for everybody walking around to intervene in a moment of urgency, or I think crisis is a fair moment. And the intervention can be life-saving. And uh, we're going to talk about what's called the chain of survival, sort of the steps that uh, are essential and the key role that uh, both lay people but then uh, fire department and ultimately EMS and the emergency departments play. Um, and I would point out that it's highly likely sometime in your life people have a chance to do this and it's probably a family member or friend because mm -hmm. it's somebody mm -hmm. near you. Definitely. And uh, it's also when you least expect it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, had a few different sort of life-threatening events as a, when I've been out in the community, not when I've been working in the emergency department. And having the training and the basic steps honestly can save a life. So uh, I was hoping one of you would introduce the concept of chain of survival, and then we'll kind of talk about the key elements and proceed. Okay. Um. So, Doc, I mean, I'll share with you, my father died of a sudden cardiac arrest 25 Sorry. years ago, and my mother was there, and so they talk about the chain of survival, which she never was taught, but we'll share that with you, and what she did was, when it took place, she ended up calling 911, which is the first step, access, early access to the 911 system to get help there. And then secondly, she started compressions, Good for um, which was mentioned her over the phone from the 911 operator. Mm -hmm. And so that'll be your second step, early BLS, early basic life support. And then thirdly in our chain is uh, early access to a defibrillator, or AED. Um, back then, 25 years ago, they didn't have that. So the next step was uh, advanced cardiac life support to get there. Um, so those chain, those steps in the chain of survival are very important. And so for the community, we really emphasize if something was to happen, to go ahead and call 911. Absolutely. get help there. Locally, we have a tendency to call our, our family members, mm -hmm. auntie and uncle, and father and mother and brother. Sometimes not even in Hawaii. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. And so we're really encouraging the folks to go ahead and call 911. Get that help there immediately. And then again, if it's a cardiac arrest, start compressions. And then um, get the AED on scene. There's a lot of AEDs out there in the public access that people can use, mm -hmm. very simple to use. There's instructions to them. They talk to you. Um, that can really make a difference in the outcome of somebody in sudden cardiac arrest. I'd like to emphasize what you just said, which is they are simple to use, and you shouldn't be afraid to try. I'm aware of a study where they uh, went into a class full of sixth graders. They gave them the machines and said, oh, that mannequin needs resuscitation. This machine might help. See if you can figure it out. They all did fine, and they did about 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Now, that's sixth graders. We're a little slower, but it's just follow the voice prompts. Exactly, um, exactly. So, okay. And then what happens? So then um, fire department through the 911 system, uh, fire department, home fire will show up. Mm -hmm. our, or possibly HPD. Or HPD as well. They have ADs on their um, squad cars mm -hmm. now. Um, 
And then we'll wait for our city and county EMS folks to show up as well mm -hmm. to put everything together. But really, it's getting that AED on scene quickly and starting those compressions is key. Time is everything. Yes, absolutely. And so one of the reasons fire departments integrally involved and HPD too is there are far more fire stations and far more police vehicles all over the island than there are EMS bases. Yes. So just by geography, uh, the chance of getting somebody with an AED uh, and another set of hands to do CPR, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's going to happen a lot quicker. Yes, absolutely. And with the advent of uh, devices in the community besides, it can be even quicker yet. Yeah. A good example would be the Ono International Airport, the Daniel K. No Airport, the public access ADs, they're all over there. Yes. And there's other venues that have them as well. And I've known of a few um, private stores that have actually deployed their AD and the outcome is positive. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the, the actual uh, numbers for, they don't get deployed very often, no. but they have a good save rate yes. because if they're Correct. deployed, it's quick. Yes. Yeah. And so that's actually something to really yeah. always remember here. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody goes down, make sure 911 gets called. If you have access to an AED, get somebody to get it for you and start CPR. Yeah. Um, so, the what's what do you consider the uh, essential time uh, ideally to get interventions in place chalk CPR um, to maximize the chance of survival I would say as soon as possible that's absolutely as true soon as possible now that's key um, getting <laughs> help there and for there. for every minute where CPR is not done your chance of survival decreases by about 10%. So it's really, really important to get that CPR started early. And that's going to be the public. That's not even us. Because exactly. it's going to take minutes for us to get there. The public is on scene. Um, it's really key. And, and even if the CPR is not perfect, it's better than no CPR. And the AEDs, I mean, I know an older generation that hasn't ever seen them before. They're a little bit intimidated by them. You can't hurt somebody with it. You can't shock somebody that doesn't need a shock. You, can, you can't push the wrong button and hurt anybody. <laughs> and the machine just talks you right through everything. So it, there's no need to be afraid of it. You just open it up, and it'll walk you through step by step. Exactly. Pretty much you have to open the lid, and it'll put the pads on as it instructs you, yeah. yep. and uh, go from there. Yeah. So they're, they're honestly spectacular devices. So Dr. Tar mentioned about the re as soon as possible, but we have 43 fire stations with only 20 ambulances on the island, which I'm sure you're aware of. So our response times are greater. Um, us getting there in a reasonable time, usually four to six minutes on the average is, is crucial. But that four to six minutes when we have bystanders performing CPR is where chances of survivability are greater. Right. And uh, so what you just described was the reason that on the order of 25 years ago, I think it was, um, started getting uh, mm -hmm. training and AEDs into HFD, and then a few years after that, uh, the police vehicles, mm -hmm. for the same yeah. reason. Uh, the, the closer somebody with a device and training is to you, and the training is more doing the CPR, making sure they mm -hmm. actually do apply it. It's not mm -hmm. that it's hard to do. Um, mm -hmm the better. I think, in fact, I think we've learned over the years that it's doing a good job of the basics is what actually mm -hmm. matters. Mm -hmm. And there's been an uh, interesting development uh, relatively recently uh, in CPR and the recommendations for how it's done in the community and also how it's done by medical providers have sort of evolved. Mm -hmm. And uh, why don't you take a Kind of a little swing at that because I think it actually reduces the barrier to uh, lay CPR and also hopefully improves the effectiveness of what we call it professional CPR. So, mm. so the stigma before was with the community CPR was uh, doing mouth to mouth. Right. Um, they've gotten away from that and what we call any hands only CPR now, where it's just compressions. Statistically, they show that compressions and getting the heart help pumping and circulating the oxygenated blood 
uh, is more valuable than stopping to give two breaths. So now with our community CPR, teaching hands-only CPR, people are more willing to help because that that mount to mount portion has been taken out of the, out of that series. So yeah, it, and obviously uh, it's quite likely you'll be dealing with a stranger, so that's a little intimidating, but in fact not a big deal. But still, it's turns out it's not a benefit either. So the, as you say, the compression only CPR is appears to be, I think in lay people's hands, at least as effective, maybe more so than, mm -hmm. than uh, trying to do the conventional. So that's a big change. Why don't you talk a little bit about um, the evolution, uh, I mean, I, I say evolution is probably the right word, uh, in provider CPR. Okay, so for us in the home and fire department, um, we went, we're through American Heart Association. We have now um, morphed, if you will, into high-performance CPR. Dr. Char brought on board with our, with our department back in 2014. And it's continuous compressions, and we do a ventilation every 10th compression. So not like the traditional 30 and 2, we continue. And uh, in recent times, in 2017, we changed it a little again. From the compressor, only doing one minute of compressions, and we switch off. And we have a demonstration that we'll provide you, and you'll see that. Um, that has proven even better results as far as ROS goes, return of spontaneous circulation that we're seeing more in the field. Um, so the event of going through this high-performance CPR I think is really beneficial. Um, and I just want to touch on what Barry mentioned about the community CPR. We've been going out throughout the communities and different work groups, organizations, and some of the folks in those um, sessions have said when they took CPR before, they were afraid to do it in the public because of mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. But now with hands-only CPR, they're willing to help. And we always mention to them that they're an extension of the first responder community because they're there right on when it happens. They witness a lot of it and they can help. As we keep saying, time is essential. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is it so is it fair to say, so CPR, I think, has gradually evolved over the years, uh, but the recognition has become how important it is to start it and have very minimal interruptions and to do adequately vigorous uh, compressions, which is, of course, why you're talking about switching off. Is that a fair mm -hmm. sort of summary of what we're now realizing is the essential? I think the, the high performance CPR is just a more efficient way to do it. You know, any, I think CPR used to be complicated. You had to <laughs> count, and was it 30 and 2 or 15 and 1 or 5 and 1? And, you know, what if I do it wrong? I don't want to hurt somebody. I don't want to do mouth to mouth. There were all kind of barriers to doing it. So the way it is now, it's so simple and so streamlined. You, you know, you tap and shout, and if the person's unresponsive, call 911, get the AED, and just start doing chest compressions. And that's it. It's absolutely as simple as that. And so what Honolulu Fire Department and the other first responders across the state, EMS and, and all the other fire departments, we're just doing a very efficient way of CPR we call high-performance CPR, and that's what Captain Grip just mentioned. And after the break, we are going to have a demonstration of the high-performance CPR, but the other piece of that is the compressions are the same for everybody. So uh, don't worry about the, the bag valve mask, mm -hmm. and if you have an AED, by all means, uh, hopefully you got somebody else with you, uh, get it put on, because that's very important. Mm -hmm. yes. um, but the compressions are the other thing to watch, and you'll see that they're fast, they're deep, and they're hard work, mm -hmm. which is why uh, people switch off. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the one other caveat uh, is we're an ocean state, and so uh, if it's a drowning, instead of a normal cardiac-related collapse, ventilation still matter. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for almost everything else, uh, Get help. In fact, repetition is beautiful. So why don't you do a brief summary of the chain of, of survival as it relates to the video, which we'll see after the break. We'll do. OK. So somebody goes down. If, if, if when you shake them, they uh, say, what are you doing? Uh, you're done. I mean, okay. you may still need 911. Uh, 
my sense is lay people particularly shouldn't worry about the pulse and uh, otherwise make sure 911 is called. Mm -hmm. uh, get an AED if you can and get to work. And, and so uh, we'll intro the video after the break and uh, talk about some other elements of education and uh, aspects to promote, improve community survival. Okay. So thank you. Uh, we'll rejoin you in a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, go, go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Hey, hey, are you okay? Checking for me, no, no pulse, not breathing, starting CPR. Here, I got a AED. We're going eight, nine, ten. Begin CPR. Eight, nine, ten. 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 Stay clear of patients. Analyzing. Stay clear of patients. Shock, de shock delivered. Begin Eight, CPR. Nine, Eight, nine, ten. Eight, nine, ten. Not this one, next 10, no, not this one. Eight, nine, ten. Oh, this one, next one. Two, yep, coming three, up. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Welcome back. Again, this is Craig Thomas, your host of Much More Medicine with Charles, Barry, and Libby from the Honolulu Fire Department. And you've just seen them doing CPR and, in fact, applying an AED uh, to a mannequin that is a representative of a victim of sudden cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. And so, Barry, I wonder if you'd kind of explain to people what they saw, what's applicable to lay people, and what they can expect to see uh, when you arrive, and also a little bit about the AED. Sure. So what you seen there was us coming in, finding a possible patient on the floor, assessing him if he's responsive, one, tapping, shouting, uh, checking if he was breathing, any pulse. There was none. Went straight into compressions. Uh, next person came in with the AED. As I was continuing the compressions, turned it on. We have a metronome that's a beat of 100 to 120. Ours is set at about 110. And started to apply the pads. Continued our CPR without disruption. 
as a third person came in, we have a BVM, which called, is a bag valve mask in a first responder field. And we were able to give one vent every 10 compressions. And as you've seen, we switched off. Um, it was speeded up a little, but normally we switch off every minute so that our quality of compressions is maintained, especially on our recoil. Um, if it was a layman person in the public, they would come on the same way, check for responsiveness, make sure the scene is safe. Um, if he's not breathing, activate the 911 system, call out for an AED, start compressions. The next person, if there was an AED, would come and apply it pretty much the same way it was mm -hmm. shown there. Uh, they're very simple, very user-friendly. Uh, they have pictures, they have verbal prompts. Um, it's very, very easy to use. Um, and basically, continue compressions until another person that's trained um, could help take over if they get tired. Or the person wakes up. Or the person wakes up, exactly. Yeah. That's, the, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. So, uh, perfect. That's a very nice description of what happens. Um, and a couple points just from the, looking at it from the layperson's perspective. So first of all, of course, won't have bag valve masks, don't need to worry Correct. about ventilation mm -hmm. at all. Uh, it is important to shout out, to try to make sure somebody's getting 911. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how uh, you might get access to an AED also. But I think the other important point is AEDs are really safe. Very. You can't hurt yourself or the patient with them. Yeah. And if you've been trained, you know, open the door, uh, pull out the pads, follow the prompts. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you haven't been trained, that's still how you do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, it's really okay. You, you want to do it. Yeah. Um, because time, again, is everything. Um, I don't know if the literature has been updated. It used to be that not only the 10% per minute you were talking about, but somewhere around five and a half minutes after collapse. Uh, so this isn't when 911 was called or mm -hmm. somebody started CPR. This is after uh, the somewhere around five and a half minutes after collapse, the chance of survival go way down. It's not that they go to zero, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. five and a half minutes is not very long. No. And so if you're near the fire station, yeah, okay. There's a police officer in a blue and white driving by, yeah, okay. Uh, but overall, the people who are at the scene are the ones who make the difference. All right, all right. Uh, the other thing that you sort of alluded to, these guys are fit. They swap off every minute. Why? Because if you don't, you start pushing less hard and it gets a little slower mm -hmm. and Correct. pretty soon it's not adequate. Yeah. So hopefully by the time uh, whoever started it is playing out and somebody else has brought an AED, there are other people to uh, tap in and, and take over. What did I miss? If they call 911, even if they've never been trained, the 911 operator can talk them through how to do chest compressions. And even mediocre chest compressions are way better than no chest compressions. Absolutely. So go ahead and try it. You're not going to hurt somebody. At that point, their heart's not beating and they're not breathing. So Which do what you can. Try. Compatible with death. So uh, I just want to emphasize, yes, they are dead. Maybe you can help bring them back, but you can't make them deader. So um, uh, that's right. Uh, do it. Uh, you can do it based on the video you just saw. Mm -hmm. Let the mm -hmm. 911 operator uh, help you. Or, better, get training. Let's talk a little bit about uh, current ATFD training and outreach, and then maybe some areas we might focus on, we hope the community does in the future. I don't know which of you would type with Charles. I sure. think it's you. Um, so, Hawaii Fire Department, we do uh, hands-only CPR training for the community and groups. Mm -hmm. um, we have a website or email address, hfdcpr at honolulu.gov. Mm -hmm. um, encourage anybody to use that. Go ahead and send us an email. Um, Bear and I have been around the island going to different groups recently just to get everybody out there trained in CPR. So, and um, we always mention, though, like it was mentioned at the very beginning, it may not be a stranger, it may be a family member. Oh, I think it's often, mm -hmm. if not a family member, or a friend, or a co-worker, yes. or uh, for reasons unclear to me, when HPD first got the, the AEDs, it seemed like it was 
always a retired officer. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. uh, it was astonishing. Mm -hmm. so, I think three quarters of the time, the person in cardiac arrest is somebody that you know, yeah. either a, a coworker, or a family member, or something, because that's where you spend your time. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so you know, we're really pushing the community to get involved and to learn it. You know? um, we want to build our numbers up like we had years ago. And so that being said, um, give us an email, hfdcprhome.com. So just to circle back that to make sure people know what I'm pretty sure I'm hearing you offer, mm -hmm. is if you contact HFD and say, you know, my book club, we got 18 people, we got eight people, uh, we would love to have training, uh, you'll figure out a way to make it happen. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. we, we have gone out to groups ages from third grade to senior citizen. Uh, so the age bracket is very broad. Uh, we did a Tai Chi class a couple weeks ago awesome. of retirees. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them was just, maybe they couldn't physically do the CPR, but educating them on the steps and the process and how it's done uh, was very valuable. Mm -hmm. they, and then in turn, they can pass that on. And if they have groups, like you said, book clubs or whatever, to call us, you might want to get a hold of these guys. We can come out and teach. Um, that's, that's another avenue. We look for eight, uh, 10 to 12 in a group. Uh, if it's smaller than that, every third Saturday of the month, our museum, our Farty Proton Museum is open and we're riding their coattail as far as teaching CPR and that. Excellent. I encourage everyone to take advantage of this resource. Mm -hmm. I hope that you get uh, better penetration in the schools. And uh, mm -hmm. for those of you able to watch right now, the brochure and the website contact are being displayed. And it's definitely been shown that the more people in the community know CPR, the better chance we all have of mm -hmm. surviving. So I'd like to thank all three of you for coming and for our listeners for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.